So we're going to start this event with a very, very important topic, which is talking about everything related to diagnosing keratoconus early. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eibach. Dr. Mitch Eibach is a residency trained optometrist, Advanced Thompson Vision in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He attended the Pacific University College of Optometry and graduated summa cum laude. Mitch completed his residency training at the Minnesota Eye Consultants with a concentration on cornea, refractive surgery, external disease, and glaucoma. Then he joined Vance Thompson Vision and focuses on advanced anterior segment surgery and pathology. He's also a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and an Intrepid Eye Society member. He's also an AOA member and the Optometric Glaucoma Society member. He is one of our favorite speakers at Wu Yu. Um, he was the very first person that I reached out to when we were discussing this symposium. And uh, it's, it's interesting because so many people are so focused on just anterior segment or posterior segment. And Dr. Eibach is one of the rare ones that is an expert in both. So he did a, a Wu Yu event a while back on visual fields and glaucoma. And now he's going to be talking about keratoconus. And we're just very, very lucky to have you, Dr. Eibach. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Stephanie. Such a nice, warm welcome there. Much appreciated. Good morning, everyone. Happy Saturday. Thanks for jumping on on the weekend to really deliver better care for our keratoconus patients. Keratoconus, as you know, is a corneal ectasia that progresses. It causes irreversible vision loss and a final outcome of corneal transplantation and possibly blindness. Our job as eye care providers is to answer the question, how do we find the missing link of diagnosis? We have some great treatment options now in 2022 for our keratoconic patients, but before we can get to any of the treatment, we have to make the diagnosis. That's what I believe is the missing link. You're going to hear lots of definitions on keratoconus over these next two days, but here's kind of mine. This is a progressive ectatic corneal condition where the cornea progressively becomes thinner, steeper, and starts to pooch or bulge forward like a cone or a nipple. And as that corneal keratometry or curvature is steepening, the patient is going to gain myopia. They have a more curved cornea, they're also going to gain astigmatism. That starts as regular astigmatism, which corrects well in glasses and contact lenses. And it's unfortunately, as this disease progresses, it becomes irregular astigmatism. These patients don't see well in glasses and contact lenses. Andy talked about this dogma that keratoconus most commonly starts in the late teens to early twenties. We're seeing it in younger and younger aged patients now, but we'll use that kind of early teens to 20s as most commonly, and then it progresses for about 30 to 40 years in a lot of our patients. The second dogma in keratoconus with age is that it just stops worsening at some point, and there's some truth to that, but I think it's an individualized number for every patient. It's not just at 50 or at 55 in every case. This is a multifactorial condition. I do believe there's a genetic component to keratoconus. It's a piece to the pie. And I think it's probably a genetic predisposition that gets activated with environmental stressors. One of the big ones that we focus on in, in our practice is mechanical eye rubbing. Also a strong association with the patient with Down syndrome and some of our connective tissue disorders as well. And so we have this umbrella of unstable or ectatic corneal conditions. The second one is refractive surgery, ectasia. This is a patient who has a progressively thinning, steepening, bulging cornea and previously had corneal refractive surgery. And so that's including LASIK, PRK, RK, radial keratotomy, AKs, asigmatic keratotomies. These patients who had a corneal incision or surgery done with a laser, that's now a patient who has a biomechanically weak cornea that's changing. Two key differentiators for refractive surgery ectasia in comparison to keratoconus, we tend to see this more unilateral with some bilateral cases. But keratoconus, as you'll cover or we'll learn in this presentation, is almost always a bilateral condition. Refractive surgery ectasia, much more unilateral. Second, it's an older age demographic for refractive surgery ectasia. These are patients who had refractive surgery in their 20s or 30s, and now we're seeing you 10 to 20 years later 
with a changing cornea. Risk factors include patients who have a bigger corneal ablation, less residual stromal tissue is left behind, a patient who has a pre-op abnormal topography or tomography, maybe the envelope was pushed on these patients, a patient who's an eye rubber, and then a patient who has RK. We all know about RK, the gift that keeps giving back into our practice, these patients who had incisions to try to flatten the cornea, and now we're seeing these patients showing up back in our practices, oftentimes in a difficult situation with an irregular cornea. Pellucid marginal degeneration, in my opinion, is just a variant of keratoconus. It's a synonym. We're treating these patients very similar to keratoconus, but the big key is you're going to see the bulge or the strongest area of steepening just farther decentered on the cornea. And so hopefully you can appreciate that in the picture on the top here. This patient has an inferior bend to that slip lamp beam. We also tend to see a later onset for pellucid marginal degeneration about 10 years later. And then we all learned in school this classic topographic shape of a crab claw or kissing dubs. I've heard beer belly as well. And really in my practice, when I see a patient with pellucid marginal degeneration, again, I think of it as just keratoconus with a different topographic shape. The patient just has a different anterior elevation mapping. And then finally, keratoglobus. Keratoglobus is a little bit different in that the most common form is congenital. Remember, patients aren't born with keratoconus. It's a degeneration. Keratoglobus, uh, most common form congenital. And this is a situation where there's not so much a cone or a bulging spot to the cornea focally, but the whole corneal dome is bulging or protruding forward. You can see that in the picture to the top. And these patients still have aberrations to their corneal tissue and vision and decreased vision as a result. As optometrists, we're diagnosing the majority of keratoconus in the US. And so understanding the prevalence and incidence of keratoconus, I think is really important. The study on the top that is most commonly quoted, this is older data now. It was done by the National Institute of Health, 1986. It was published, it was done in Olmstead County, which is near Rochester, Minnesota, not far from where I practice. And this study is now approaching 35 years old. And it said that keratoconus incidence is about one in 2000 patients, but that game has changed. We have better incidence and prevalence studies. Now on the left is a table of studies that you can dive in tonight if you're looking to fall asleep, but I'll draw your attention to two. On the very bottom is Hashemi et al. This is published in Cornea. It's a worldwide or global meta-analysis and systematic review. They took all these papers and mashed the data together. And they found that worldwide keratoconus incidence is about one in 700 patients. Right above that is Chan et al. It's also published in Cornea. It was a birth cohort study done in Australia. What that means is babies born at birth had testing done on them. And they brought these patients back somewhere in their mid twenties and did a myriad of tests on them. One was a corneal topography. And in that study, they found, and this is a centralized region in Australia, keratoconus incidence in one in 84 individuals. I thought an interesting secondary take home from that study was of the one in 84 patients who was diagnosed with keratoconus at that screening topography, only 15% knew they had the condition coming back to get that test done. On the right, a study out of Denmark looking at their keratoconus rates in the last 10 to 15 years. And what they found is it's two to three times increased in the last 10 to 15 years. And so why are we seeing this increased incidence of keratoconus? Did this become contagious? Is there something in the water? Of course not. We have better diagnostics. We have better awareness. We have some famous faces now talking about keratoconus. Steph Curry, Golden, St Golden State Warriors basketball player is one of them. There's many others. And then outside of the US in the early 2000s was the advent of corneal crosslinking. And so this new treatment drove patients into eye care providers' offices because of that awareness and now new treatment. And so who gets keratoconus? This is the Collaborative Longitudinal Evaluation of Keratoconus Study or the CLEC study. This was a huge study. It was an observational study of over 1,200 patients, all with keratoconus. And they monitored these patients did testing on them for about eight years, initially published in contact lens and anterior eye. And with regard to epidemiology and keratoconus, what the CLEC study found is there was no race predilection. It was equal across 
all races. There's some more recent systematic reviews that say patients of Middle Eastern descent are at the highest prevalence of keratoconus. In the CLEC study, 96% of patients had bilateral disease. I think that's important because as you're doing a fantastic job diagnosing the 16 year old in your chair with keratoconus in his or her right eye, we wanna get that right eye buttoned up, treated, but we can't forget about the contralateral eye. CLEC study said 96% of the time it will be a bilateral condition. CLEC study said 13% of patients had a positive family history for keratoconus. They found autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive traits in this study. And again, I think it's patients who have underlying genetic risk, and then that gets activated with environmental stressors. The biggest one, in my opinion, is going to be eye rubbing. In the CLEC study, 50% of patients admitted to being an aggressive eye rubber. Continuing with what does the keratoconus patient look like? On these words to the left, if you start on vernal keratoconjunctivitis conjunctivitis and allergies and you move the four to the right, atopic dermatitis, dry eye disease, and floppy eyelid syndrome, these all have atopies or a stimulus to rub, touch, and press on the eyes. I think of eye rubbing as the number one modifiable risk factor for patients. Unfortunately, a patient with Down syndrome has a 10 to 20 times increased risk of developing keratoconus according to the literature and in my experience, these are patients who almost have an inability to not rub, touch, press on their eyes. These are patients who we want to catch early because if we don't and they do proceed to needing corneal transplantation, usually has a very low success rate in this patient demographic. And so my opinion and my call to action would be if you have a patient in your practice with Down syndrome in their teens to 20s, we really need to have some type of topography or tomography done on these patients on an every 12 to 18 month uh, basis at minimum. And then connective tissue disorders, ehlers downlos mitral valve prolapse, there's others as well. Here's a patient that we interviewed. Unfortunately, we might not have sound here. And so I'll kind of talk you through what Haley says here. Hi, Haley. Hello. Uh, nice to see you. And you were recently. And so Haley says she comes into our practice. She was diagnosed at an outside provider with keratoconus and comes into our practice wanting to learn more and hopefully have corneal collagen crosslinking to arrest the disease. And as we get talking with Haley about eye rubbing, she says, No, I actually don't rub my eyes, but I touch on them a lot. And we asked her to show us and she squeezed them. So almost like crab claws would squeeze on her eyes to get relief. And the two take homes I have from that video is number one, eye rubbing is a habit and habits are hard to break. And so if there's someone in the room with the patient, whether that's a loved one, a spouse, get them on board. We need them on our team. And number two, teach them to slap their hands away so that they stop eye rubbing because I really think it's important. Really kind of strengthening or reinforcing that is studies have shown that 50 to 70% of adults with keratoconus are eye rubbers. There's some very highly renowned practitioners in the keratoconus space that will say you actually don't get keratoconus if you don't rub your eyes. And maybe that jury is still out, but there's a pediatric study where they asked mom and dad of kiddos with keratoconus, does your son or daughter rub touch press on their eyes? And it was about a 90% hit rate. And so we got to get patients to stop rubbing. This isn't your gently just touching around the corners patient, or maybe they get some sleep out. This is the aggressive knuckle rubbing. They'll use their palm. We have a term called pillow divers where patients will put their hand under their pillow and almost grind that eye into the pillow. And I think there's really negative effects from that. This video on the right is fascinating work by Dr. Damien Gatnell at the Rothschild Foundation, where they use dynamic MRI to look at the effects of eye rubbing. One more time here. And so you can see that the cornea gets depressed all the way into the back of the anterior segment. But not only that, the whole globe gets depressed posterior in this patient. And this was a patient with a normal corneal strength. This was not a keratoconic patient. And so we talked about age a little bit. We've previewed this, but who gets keratoconus according to age? In the aforementioned CLEC study, the average age was 39.5 in that study. 
According to a study by keratoconusgroup.org, where they surveyed patients at what age were you diagnosed with keratoconus, 10 to 19 and 20 to 29 made up over 70% of the patients diagnosed with keratoconus. That's good. But 30 to 40, almost 20%. And then if we lump 40 and older together, it's almost 10% of patients getting diagnosed in their 40s or above. We want to continue to move that age younger and younger, intervene earlier and earlier in the disease. And so that starts with making the initial diagnosis. On the right, this is a study by Ferdy et al. This is one of the other big landmark studies in keratoconus. It's titled Keratoconus, the Natural Progression in Over 11,000 Eyes. And so huge study, lots of big, important take-homes in keratoconus came out of this study. But the one that I'll draw your attention to here is this scatter plot. On the x-axis, they used age. On the y-axis, they used 12-month change in K-max. And the take-home is young patients progress faster. The study concluded that for every 10 years of increased age, K-max progressed 0.8 diopters less per year. Young age is a risk factor for keratoconus in the progression. And so let's move into the comprehensive eye exam. This is defined by the National Institute of Health and all about vision. These are kind of the tests that are in most primary care or comprehensive yearly eye exams. And then everything highlighted in red is what I think you can either discern clues from red flags for keratoconus or maybe even make the diagnosis of keratoconus. It's important to remember that even if you don't have all the fancy corneal diagnostics, you can still be great at finding the missing link in keratoconus by finding the red flags and putting the puzzle together. Two keys here, not all optometrists are doing aberometry on every visit. I don't think that's one of the strongest ones for our keratoconus population in the comprehensive eye exam. And then second, not as many practitioners are maybe doing pupil dilation at all comprehensive eye exams now due to non midriatic fundus cameras and other ways to look at the posterior segment. But if you do have pupil dilation, it makes retinoscopy and seeing the irregular reflex much easier. And so narrowing in, going through our comprehensive eye exam here, before we get to all the fancy tools, what do we all have in our armamentarium for diagnosing these patients? First, with regard to symptoms, this can be tough. Keratoconus can almost be like glaucoma and that patients aren't going to come in and say, I'm having some changes with my vision. I think it could be keratoconus, but blurring of vision and or loss of vision. Bullet point number two is a big one for me. A patient has decreased tolerance to their contact lenses. Remember, as patients are becoming more and more warped or they have more curvature to their cornea, they get a toric lens maybe in as that number gets higher and higher, every time they blink, this is an irregular cornea, that lens rocks. And so they're having this constant instability in vision, a halo around lights and or ghosting. Another big one for me. I love these two pictures to the right. If you look at the sign that says three hour time limit, you can see there the R almost has a secondary image, second with the arrow as well. But unfortunately, keratoconus vision symptoms can be hard to pinpoint until the later stages of the disease. And so we have to use some of our other diagnostics. As we move into our first diagnostic device here, it's a device that's in almost every optometric practice. It's our auto refractor. This is an objective measurement of the eye's prescription. And the way that it works is it passes this light beam through the eye, reflects it off the back of the eye. And the image that's recorded coming back into the device the reflection bounce back gives us a starting prescription of the eye's refractive power. An autorefractor can be a great tool for patients with, who are in the pediatric population or maybe have intellectual delays because it's fast and it requires no verbal response. It's often done by one of our technicians or our nurses before we as the doctor come in to see the patient. And we're gonna get this printout that looks like this on the right. Oftentimes your autorefractor will be combined with your auto keratometer or getting keratometry, the curvature of the cornea. And so here you see kind of five auto refractions here. It sums those together, gives us the average on the bottom. We see the auto keratometry values as well. Two different options here. You can have a tabletop version on the bottom or handheld auto K auto refractor as well. How do we take this into practice then Monday morning to say what's abnormal? Well, first it's just understanding the values that we're seeing back. 
What is a normal autorefraction? What is a normal autokeratometry value? And then second, error messages. An error message can be a pretty big key that this patient has an irregular shaped cornea. This warrants, in my opinion, going farther and getting a corneal topography. Our autorefractors are designed to measure a smooth prolate cornea. And that patient with a cone, we don't have that smooth cornea. It's not all inclusive to keratoconus, though patients with corneal grafts, dry eye, they could blink, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy can give us these error messages as well. And so to understand abnormal, we have to understand what's normal and put those pieces together. And so if you're an eye care provider seeing these three or four auto refractions here on a new patient, which one would you say is suspicious for keratoconus? And if we can launch our first poll, please. And let's see the results. Yeah, over 90% of you are saying that it's option number C, and that's the option that I would pick as well. But why? I think a cookbook number to remember is three diopters of refractive cylinder. If we see three diopters or more of glasses astigmatism, this is a number just to remember as, hey, the chances that this patient has keratoconus goes up significantly. In the CLEC study, it was 2.5 diopters of astigmatism on average. In the Ferdi et al. study, it was 2.8 diopters. There's a study by Panero et al. that says more advanced keratoconus will start to hit at that three diopters of refractive cylinder. Second is the axis of astigmatism. Remember, young patients much more commonly will have with the rule astigmatism when it's a healthy cornea compared to against the rule or oblique. Second, our auto keratometer, we said this is commonly combined with the auto refractor here. This is telling us the corneal curvature. Remember, average is 43 to 43.5 diopters. That gives us K1 or most commonly referred to as flat K and then K2 or steep K. If you use the difference of those, that gives you your corneal astigmatism. The study to the left is published in ophthalmology where they looked at 300 patients, 200 normal corneas, 100 keratoconic corneas, and they wanted to answer the question, how sensitive is auto K's at detecting keratoconus? They used a mathematical equation or the sum of steep K, flat K, and the axis of astigmatism. And they found, not surprisingly, the combination of all three was significantly more sensitive than any, any of the individual counterparts or tests alone. If we did have to separate them out, the absence of with the rule astigmatism was actually the number one predictive autokeratometry finding. As we go into some of the details here, 93% of normal corneas had with the rule astigmatism. 41% of the keratoconus group had against the rule or oblique. And then two thirds of the keratoconus cohort was not correctable to 2020. And so I think shown in green is what you take back on Monday to your practice. If you have a patient who has against the rule or oblique astigmatism and is not correctable to 2020 in the four after, this patient really needs to have a topography or a tomography. How about a refraction? On a comprehensive eye exam, almost every patient is going to get a refraction. We spend a ton of time in school learning forced choice, which is better one or two to get the patient's subjective refraction. But how do we use that in keratoconus? If I'm seeing a new patient who I'm refracting and they just have a poor image quality, I give them forced choice, which is better one or two, the same. Can you do it again? Something's not right with that patient's visual symptoms system and we want to dive deeper. And then if I have a patient who's just not corrected to 2020 and is otherwise young and healthy, I'm probably going to get a topography or tomography on this patient, as well as some other testing. I want to see what the retina looks like, the nerve looks like, but something is off for this patient. And if you have a patient who's returning year after year for their refraction, and you just are constantly doing glasses remakes for these patients, I would want a topography. And then the two cookbook numbers to remember, if you have a manifest refraction, who is one year later has increased by a half diopter or more in the myopic spherical equivalent or over one diopter of 
glasses astigmatism. These were the numbers that were used by the FDA in the keratoconus and corneal cross-linking studies for progressive KCN. And so two numbers to remember there, half diopter more of the myopic spherical equivalent increase or one diopter of astigmatism. How about retinoscopy? Retinoscopy is a great tool for actually making the definitive diagnosis for keratoconus. This is again, a nice test for patients who have cognitive delays or pediatric patients because they don't have to respond. You just have to get them to look straightforward. And we know that we're we're moving this slit light beam back and forth across the patient's pupillary light reflex. We're grading that, changing the dials. As we're getting closer and closer, it's becoming larger and larger. But for keratoconus, these patients will have this pathognomonic scissoring reflex. It almost chops. It's a warped image as well. This study on the bottom left is published in Cornea. They looked at 123 patients with suspected keratoconus or other corneal irregularities. And they wanted to answer the question, how specific and sensitive is retinoscopy in diagnosing keratoconus? And they compared it against pentacam tomography and actually the Balin Ambrosio advanced ectasia display. And what they found is retinoscopy had a 98% sensitivity for keratoconus, meaning if a patient had keratoconus, retinoscopy caught it 98% of the time and a 78% specificity, meaning if ret said, yes, this is keratoconus, it was right almost 80% of the time. And this is approaching really, in my opinion, the gold standard, which is going to be corneal tomography. And so a very good tool here. And so in your practice, are you commonly doing retinoscopy? And if you are, could you recognize a scissoring reflex? Let's see the results here. Wow. I'm really surprised. So two thirds of you are saying, yes, I could recognize it. I'm doing retinoscopy very commonly in my practice. Admittedly, that's higher than the number I expected to see. A lot of you are doing it and would say, maybe this is hard to see. And so for the ones that maybe said, yes, I'm not as confident looking at that scissoring reflex. Let's look at it here on the normal, on the left, as we're moving that slip beam back and forth, it's getting larger and larger. We're changing the axis or the orientation of that, we're changing the lenses. But on the right now, you have this bent reflex. It almost looks like a scissor that's chopping here. And you can move this in any meridian and you're going to get a pretty similar picture here. You won't ever get that to look like a nice full image or reflex back to you. And this is a patient that has almost this dense center and then tails on their reflex, almost like a scissor that's chopping. And so that's the scissoring reflex, pretty pathognomonic for keratoconus. How about slit lamp exam? A good clinical exam will help for any pathology in keratoconus. We're specifically looking for a Fleischer's ring or pigment around or below the cone that's in the anterior stroman epithelium, Voigt Stree. That's on the picture to the left. These stress cracks or almost stretch cracks as the cornea continues to become warped and bulges. You get these small little striae or lines in the cornea. You'll want to have high mag to see this stromal thinning and scarring and large corneal nerves. Munson sign is pretty advanced keratoconus sign, but if you have a patient who looks down and their lower eyelid pooches out with keratoconus, that's Munson sign. And then acute corneal high drops. That's the picture on the top right. Remember high drops is a break in decimase membrane. You can see it in this beautiful picture here. As the break in decimase membrane happens, you have a fluid rush into the cornea. Cornea becomes edematous acutely. This is very painful for our patients. Over time, the cornea will detergest, it will thin back down, but a large scar is left behind. The problem with diagnosing keratoconus at the slit lamp is once we have significant thinning, striae, especially acute high drops and scarring, we've not only lost uncorrected visual acuity, but we've lost best corrected visual acuity as well. Before we move into advanced diagnostics and keratoconus, this would be one of the take-home slides for me of just in my practice, if I have topography, when should I be using it? If I don't, when should I be referring out? And so here's some of those red flags or clues that necess necessitate a topography or tomography. So if you have a patient in your chair who just can't stop rubbing their eyes, I think a topography is warranted. Auto Ks or keratometry over 48 diopters is almost always going to be abnormal. An error message, refractive cylinder over three diopters we talked about. 
uh, the abnormal scissoring reflex, corneal stria, or a warped beam. And as you see more and more keratoconus, I can start to look at a slit lamp beam and say if that's going to be a keratoconic patient or not. And then a family history with keratoconus. Now we have genetic testing that we can do in the office to look at their genetic risk. And we'll talk more about that as well. And so moving into advanced diagnostic imaging for keratoconus, in my opinion, the gold standard here is really going to be corneal topography and even more in my practice, corneal tomography, a device that can look and image the front cornea and the back cornea. But advanced imaging and keratoconus, I think a, a pretty inclusive list would be topography, tomography, epithelial mapping, anterior segment OCT, probably an aberometer. And I think corneal biomechanics are still building in the keratoconus space. I think bullet point number two is an important one. If you're suspicious, you're seeing the red flags, but maybe you don't have a corneal topographer or tomographer in your practice, refer for imaging. If you send that patient out and you get the results back from the referring practice or the practice that has some of these tools and they say, hey, it's actually a normal cornea, great. Now we have this baseline scan that we can look at if this patient develops keratoconus over time, we can always go back to that as the reference. If you send the patient out and it's irregular, well, now you've made hopefully an earlier diagnosis and we can move forward. With treatment, early signs of keratoconus uh, can include some of these stromal and epithelial thickness changes. This is gonna be most commonly on epithelial mapping. Posterior elevation changes. There's lots of studies that will say the first point that's going to change on an ectatic eye is the posterior cornea or the posterior float. And so we can catch it very early using that wavefront aberrations and then topographic changes. What we've commonly heard, what we've learned over time, inferior steepening, and then irregularity to the indices, maybe steep keratometry for patients. And so let's launch another poll. Do you have topography or tomography in your practice? Let's go ahead and see the results. Yeah, wow, this is a, a great group of attendees kind of a practicing at the next level in keratoconus on this webinar this morning. 61% yes, I do, 34% no, and then less than, you know, right around 5% say I'm using ASOCT or epithelial mapping. I ask that question a lot. And one of my friends and colleagues, Dr. John Gellies does as well. And I'll tell you, hit rate is right around 35 to 40% on most of them. And so great group. Congratulations to you guys. I think that's very, very helpful in topography and tomography for your keratoconic patients. So it'll be a review for a lot of you, but first a corneal topography. This is telling us the anterior corneal shape. It's an elevation map of the cornea, think of a topographic land map where we're looking at elevations and depressions. Very similar, we're just doing that on our patient's cornea now. It tells us the corneal shape, the symmetry, K1 and K2 are two keratometry values. And then again, the difference of those will tell us the corneal astigmatism. Most commonly corneal topographers are going to be a placido disc topographer. There are other ways of doing corneal topography as well, but I think this is the most common route. A placido disc topographer has these concentric light rings. Those are shown onto our patient's cornea. What's reflected back then is analyzed. The reflection of that is called the Myers. And the closer the Myers are spaced together, the steeper that area of patient's cornea is going to be. That then gets relayed and then displayed on a heat map printout. You can see that on the bottom right. I like to have this for patient education. And so I tell patients, the warmer the color gets on this bar, the higher that number is, the steeper the area of corneal tissue is going to be. And this is a pretty classic keratoconic appearance here. Before we go too far into what is abnormal, let's review normal. That's going to be on the left picture, the bottom right symmetric bow tie. A bow tie is telling us that patients have two corneal curvatures on the cornea. We want them to be pretty symmetric. This is a with the rule appearance, but this can be turned. We just want to make sure that the two bow ties or dumbbells are equal in size and about 180 degrees apart. That gets translated then to the heat map on the bottom right. We have a little bit of lid blocking the full picture here, but this is a patient who has a normal topography here, a normal map. Right above that, a fairly yellow or symmetric 
corneal topography anterior map. This is a patient who doesn't have much, maybe any corneal astigmatism. And so it will be a pretty uniform shape and color across the whole picture. In my practice, probably the three most common keratoconic appearances is going to be the round, the inferior steepening, and the asymmetric bow tie with skewed radial axis. That would probably be a more early keratoconic presentation in my practice. There are some cases though, where having anterior elevation mapping alone can be tricky. And I think a lot of practices are going to have corneal topography over corneal tomography. And so making sure that we can catch the mimickers or the ones that could be leading us astray. This is a 33 year old who presented to our practice for a refractive evaluation. She had mild burning and stinging in her contact lenses. She removes contact lenses and then she was an eye rubber. You can see her corneal topography here. K1 and K2. K2 is only 42.5 diopters. She had this central hotspot, 1.22 diopters of astigmatism. It's not oblique. On slit lamp exam, this patient had confluent punctate keratitis, lots of other signs and symptoms of dry eye. And so we treated this patient aggressively. We used an immunomodulator. We had a little bit of steroid on board. We placed some plugs. This is four weeks later, what this patient's corneal topography looks like. And so dry eye can be a mimicker of keratoconus on anterior elevation mapping. I think a patient who is wearing small diameter GPs and maybe is compressing the cornea, we can get maybe blocking or masking a keratoconic appearance. And then patients with EBMD, patients who are an acute eye rubber, if you get them to stop rubbing, the map will change as well. But how common is this? This is a case series of patients with keratoconjunctivitis sicca, it's published in cornea, where they wanted to answer the question, how many of our dry eye patients will show topographic changes that mimic keratoconus? And what they found is 10% of dry eye patients show a keratoconic topographic change. And so how do we tease this out to make sure that if we only have corneal topography in our practice, we're looking at, is this dry eye or is this keratoconus. Well, first posterior elevation mapping will really help, but if you don't have that corneal pachymetry, look at the refraction and then look at the corneal staining as well. Corneal tomography. This is probably my favorite corneal diagnostic in our practice. And I'm very fortunate to be in a practice that has all of the kind of newest, fanciest technologies. Corneal tomography. This is most commonly going to be a Scheinflug camera. I like to describe it to my patients as almost like a CT scan. There's these slit images that goes 360 degrees, adds those images up to tell us the corneal picture. Scheinflug technology is specifically designed with advanced optics to be able to measure and image a non-planar or non-flat surface. Think of the cornea. It's not a flat surface. And so these Scheinflug cameras do a better job here, a little bit more precise. This is four maps selectable or four maps refractive. This is one of the printouts you can get, but this is can be customized. This is the one we use most commonly in our keratoconic population. On the top left, this is the axial curvature map. It is synonymous with the sag, uh, sagittal curve or tangential curve map. These are all the same. It gives us K1 and K2. It tells us another new number, K max, the steepest keratometry value, which is really helpful. It's used in a lot of the keratoconic studies. That is really our anterior elevation map, tells us the corneal shape and symmetry. Top right, this is our front elevation map or our anterior float. What we're doing here is from a best fit sphere or what's normal, we're overlaying our patient's anterior elevation map. I don't use this as much in keratoconus. Bottom left, this is our pachymetry map. So it maps out the thickness of the cornea across all the different points. Remember that the thinnest corneal pachymetry should be at the apex or the very center. And so the three millimeter ring there, one of the tools that I like to use is if I have a patient who has their thinnest corneal pachymetry outside the three millimeter ring, this is going to be a red flag in our practice. And then bottom right, this is the posterior float or posterior elevation map. Again, it's comparing our patient's posterior corneal shape to normal and then looks at the deviation. Plus 12 to plus 15 is kind of a cookbook number I used for starting to be pretty suspicious of keratoconus. And then a lot of the literature you, you'll read about the IS ratio or inferior to superior ratio. What they're doing here is this printout on the top left has the three, five, seven, and nine millimeter rings. They're comparing the keratometry value inferior at the five millimeter ring compared to superior at the five millimeter ring. And it's a ratio. 
Less than one is very normal. One to 1.5 is kind of your yellow slow down. We need to monitor this patient closer. Anything over two is highly, highly pathognomonic for a keratoconic patient. This is Balin Ambrosio Enhanced Ectasia Display. This is a proprietary to Oculus and the Pentacam. Michael Balin and Renato Ambrosio were two fellowship trained cornea specialists. They came up with this enhanced Ectasia display. Nicely, it's color coded for us. And this can be used often as the tiebreaker here. It, there's some exclusion mapping where they take off the central three and a half millimeters. And I bet one of our other prestigious speakers this weekend will talk through this in depth. And so I'll save you some of that, but it's color coded for us and can be used as the tiebreaker in some of these difficult patients. Monitoring for progression. Remember that keratoconus is a progressive condition. For our patients with keratoconus, we need to be able to define progression to use some of our treatment modalities. And I think tomography is an invaluable tool for these patients. And so here's a case here where we utilized two tomographic maps in 2019. This patient came to see us on the left. You can see the anterior elevation map, kind of a, an oblique appearance to the astigmatism. It's maybe a little bit asymmetric but not overly steep K's, K-max was 43.5, pachymetry of 527, inferior to superior ratio of 1.2. But we were highly suspicious of this right eye. And the reason was we had the trick of knowing that this patient's left eye had advanced keratoconus. He was 15 years old. And so we brought him back five months and then 10 months later, that's now the scan you're seeing on the right. K-max increased to 44.6 in eight months, pachymetry further thin, the inferior to superior ratio is now 1.9. We actually cross-linked this 15 or 16 year old boy in his left eye first, but now in his right eye on this pentacam on the right, he was still uncorrected 2020 minus, best corrected to 2020. We move forward with cross-linking. We're still able to achieve that visual acuity. Anterior segment OCT or ASOCT, in my opinion, is not a standalone diagnostic for keratoconus. I think it can be really nice to have this supportive uh, diagnose, for diagnosis though, and this is really just a cross-sectional view of the corneal shape. We can look at areas of thinning as well as areas of steepness or the keratometry. You can see the different shapes with the overlying corneal topography above. And so normal versus keratoconic where it's thinned, it starts to become steeper at the very center, pellucid marginal degeneration where our thinning and cone is farther decentered inferior, and then keratoglobus where it just has a whole kind of radius of curvature increase and thinning just diffusely across that whole patient's cornea. One advantage of ASOCT, in my opinion, for practitioners who maybe are looking to add a new diagnostic for keratoconus is if you have a posterior OCT, you have an optic nerve and macula or retina OCT, you can often add just the anterior segment module and you're not acquiring a lot of extra cost. The cost to acquisition is lower to have another technology in your practice. I think it can be really helpful if you're co-managing patients who have corneal cross-linking because you can see the demarcation line or how deep that treatment went for these patients. And so you can often just add on the anterior segment module. You don't need a new standalone space for this. You're just adding it on to the current device. These are some pictures here. Far, uh, the far left is normal. The middle is a keratoconic patient who then progresses to corneal high drops. Next, let's move to epithelial mapping. This is measuring and mapping just the anterior 50 microns of our patient's cornea. There's some emerging data and articles that are saying that this may be one of the earliest predictors of keratoconus when we're seeing changes to the epithelium here. On the left is very normal epithelial map, 50 to probably 58 microns is very normal. On the right, you can see a keratoconic epithelial map. In keratoconic patients, the epithelium will thin over the area of stromal thinning or the area of total pachymetry thinning. The epithelium will thin over the area of the posterior float, pooch, or bulge forward. It will thin over the area of cone on your anterior map. And so epithelial mapping probably adds the most value in these very, very early keratoconic patients. Maybe it's even subtopography yet at this point. Here's a 31-year-old patient that was referred to our practice for keratoconus. The referring doctor did a great job of saying, I'm a little unsure of the keratometry value. It's the case is this keratoconus. This patient was uncorrected 2015 in both eyes when I saw her. 
Right eye, we have a K1 of 45.9, K2 of 48.3. You can see the map here. So kind of working in between oblique and with the rule of stigmatism, we have thin corneal pachymetry at 461, maybe very early change on posterior float. You can see her epithelial mapping below. And so let's launch this poll. Is this keratoconus or no? And would you recommend treatment or monitoring? Let's go ahead and see the results. 30% of you said this is not keratoconus. 30% um, said, yes, it's form fruits and I would monitor. 30% said, yes, it's keratoconus and I would monitor. And the minority, 12% said, yes, this is keratoconus, I would refer for treatment. I'll tell you what we did for this patient is we did say, yes, this is keratoconus. And we actually did do corneal cross-linking when she was uncorrected 2015. And so, I think putting all these pieces together with having a K2 of 48, it's almost always going to be abnormal. Pachymetry of 460, almost always abnormal. And then really the tiebreaker and what pushed us over the edge was the epithelial mapping, having that thinning of epithelium directly over the cone and the stromal thinning as well. And so here's a paper published looking at epithelial mapping to differentiate normal versus keratoconus suspects or form frus versus a keratoconic patient. And in the keratoconus group, expect to see thin total epithelium, a thinner central epithelium, thinner minimal epithelial thickness, a greater difference superior to inferior, and then a thin epi over the area of posterior change. I really like to have a cookbook number of what alerts me. And this study said that 52 microns of epithelium at the thinnest point or less, you should dive deeper. A key from this paper though, was that there was no single parameter that was strong enough in correlation to diagnose keratoconus on its own in sensitivity and specificity. And so again, you need the power of all these numbers together. Higher order aberrations are really optical inequalities or shortcomings of the eye that don't correct well in glasses in contacts. We can scan those higher order aberrations. This is a picture from what's called the eye design here. And on the top left, this is your axial curvature map. And so corneal shape, bottom left is wavefront higher order aberrations just mapped out across the cornea. I like to focus in on the RMS or root mean square error. The higher that number gets, once it gets above 0.6 or 0.7, it's a pretty irregular cornea. And then on the bottom right, this just maps out our Zernike polynomials with a bar graph here. There's a study that, that is published in Optometric and Visual Sciences that looks at higher order aberrations for diagnosing keratoconus. And there was two main findings. Total RMS error and the vertical coma were the two numbers that most strongly correlated with keratoconic patients. Rounding out some of our in-office diagnostics that we have is genetics in keratoconus. There's definitely a link between genetics in keratoconus. I think of it as a piece to the pie. Remember the CLEC study said that only 13% of patients had a positive family history of keratoconus. There's another study that's in stronger support of genetics by doctors Rabinowitz and Wang, as well as others, where they did a family aggregate or genome tree for these patients. And what that study found was a first degree family member, mom, dad, brother, sister, son, or daughter, who has keratoconus increased the keratoconic rate in patients up to 3.34%. And so that's about five times at least higher than the general population. And so what I'm asking patients is, I'm not worried about Aunt Susie with keratoconus. I wanna know mom, dad, brother, sister, son, or daughter, because I do think that's a risk factor for keratoconus. And so genetics plays a part. Here's a newer genetic testing option that can be in your practice called Avigen. It's from Avellino Labs. And in spe uh, specifics to keratoconus, this in-office cheek swab looks at 75 genes with over a thousand gene variants, and then adds up a patient's risk score for keratoconus. This is called polygenic testing. And so it's not a yes, no answer. It's looking at all these genes and then trying to find genes that correlate with keratoconus, and then adding up the zero to 100 red, yellow, green risk score for a patient. Avigen also does a great job for TG, BFI, genes and corneal dystrophies, where it is a monogenic test where it says yes or no. But I think this can be helpful in some of our patients. And for me, this is more of a tiebreaker. 
How do we use this information? What's the rub? Because unfortunately, Avigen is not a yes, no answer. It's the patient's genetic risk score. It's not a standalone diagnostic. And so here's how I most commonly use it in my practice. If I have a patient with a high genetic risk score, it often changes my follow-up. And so maybe that patient I was going to see nine months later, I'm going to change that to four or five based on the genetic risk score. Or maybe alternatively, I get to stretch them out longer because it's one more piece of information that gives me confidence. We'll use it for follow-up of family members as well. And so trying to use familial education and screening with this has been helpful in our practice. Second, it's a tiebreaker. If I have a patient who's right on the edge of, are we making the call of keratoconus or not? And are we going to treat, especially with corneal cross-linking, this can swing the pendulum one way or the other. And then probably most impactful in my practice has actually been in the refractive surgery clinic or practice patients who want to have their corneal curvature changed. And I want to try to examine their ectasia risk. It can help us make the decision of can we do LASIK or should we do PRK? Should we do PRK or maybe nothing? Where does an implantable columnar lens fit into our practice? And so we covered a lot of really good tests, diagnostics to help with keratoconus, but are we catching it early? This is a 2020 article that's publishing contact lens and anterior eye. It's out of Belgium at the Antwerp University, and they looked at their keratoconic diagnostic patterns over the last five years. 722 eyes, the average age for diagnosis was about 25 years old. That's pretty good. But the average max K was 58 diopters. A lot of our keratoconus staging would say that's in moderate or severe keratoconus. And a third of patients had a thinnest pack of less than 450 microns. So the conclusion starts with, despite advances in diagnostic tools, keratoconus is often diagnosed at a relatively late stage. This paper published in Grafie's Archives of Clinical and Experimental Ophthalmology reinforces prioritizing earlier diagnosis and early intervention. Two keys for me, stage of keratoconus, the better corrected eye, the eye with the better visual acuity potential was the number one driver of quality of life. And so better, best corrected visual acuity and the better seeing eye was the number one driver of a patient's quality of life with keratoconus. And then number two, independent of stage, mild, moderate, or severe, corneal cross-linking improved quality of life in all stages of keratoconus. And so the reason that we focused a whole hour on earlier diagnosis is because before you can treat keratoconus, you really have to have the diagnosis. This is what I believe in 2022, the mantra or protocol for managing keratoconic patients should look like in most cases. We wanna diagnose early, and then we wanna intervene early, stop the progression, get the disease arrested, and then come back and rehabilitate vision. Thank you guys so much. I'm excited to take some questions. Tuning in this morning, you know, 2,500 ODs registering for this event is just so powerful. I know this stuff excites you because you tuned in on Saturday morning. Hopefully it does more than his swing. Uh, my son Bennett gets excited when he goes in that. It just puts him right to sleep. And so I look forward to questions and the rest of this great education weekend. Well, thanks, Dr. Ivok. This was a wonderful presentation. I think you did such a great job just explaining why it's so important to detect keratoconus early. And I will say I'm really surprised at how many people are using retinoscopy. I'm so glad that you asked that question. Yeah. I was I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see how many people said they were using it.